then um when uh, we went over and had the papers we made our final payment on that house in the, on division street or not division street but um, michigan street the people that had bought our house was going they paid us all the money they owed us they had an auction sale on their farm and then they paid us all they owed us on the 17th day of march of 19 the year the twins were born anyhow 1935 1938 and um um so so that day then or i mean maybe it was the day we bought the place in the first made the bargain to buy the place in the first place but we made the bargain or the way it, there was the it was supposed to be made out that if I died, the house was Francis' house. If Francis died, the house was my house. Well, after all, if you've got four little tiny kids, um, why not make it out that way? If I died, certainly he didn't. Uh, certainly, I didn't have a sister or a brother or anybody that should come in and get a, a few hundred dollars out of it, or vice versa. And. Um, and then, of course, again, some people might have had it made out in such a way that um, he would only have half of it, and my half would go to my four children. But four little kids, you know, let him have the house in case I die. And uh, well, then, and they, but they had always sent our taxes, Francis Black, which, I mean, I didn't care. Um, so the first tax receipts we had on that house was Francis Black. Well, then when Francis died, they sent our taxes to Francis Black Estate. Estate? You mean, now we've got to have this all, um, whatever it is they do, straightened out. Or why didn't they say Helen Black? Because Francis died. Evidently they knew he died because they put it Francis Black Estate. Otherwise they just, just sent it Francis Black. And um, so... I wondered, you know, why? So, and as much as I hated to spend 15 cents to call Charlotte, but 15 cents, after all, would have bought a loaf of bread. <laughs> and uh, so, but I called Charlotte and I talked to the man and I said, why did you put it Francis Blatt Estate? Oh, well, he could have put it um, in my name. But anyhow, I let him know why not then. And so from then on they did. Well, then, what they do, do then, they make out the taxes up to Charlotte. So they send this whole stack of taxes over to Eaton Rapids to the city clerk over there. Then the city clerk over there mails them out to each person. So here, um, um, they put my taxes and mail them to Howard Blatt. <laughs> and then Howard, instead of giving them to me, he gives them to his mother and she gives them to me. Why did he mail them to, Fran to Howard Blatt? I was furious about it because uh, you see your taxes tell you what your house is worth. So now if they mail your taxes to me, I know what, your, what they consider your house is worth. And, uh, um, but I thought, well, you know, he picked up these two together. The two Blacks would have been right side by side. And uh, so it's a mistake, you know what I mean. Get, don't get mad. Calm down, you know. After all, this is a mistake. Um, but then the next taxis come along, and they were still mail mailed to Howard Blatt. Of course, Howard Blatt was quite a liar in a good many ways. So he might have said, "Well, probably from now on, I'll have to pay Helen's taxes." And so maybe, and maybe that man figured that if he mails them to Howard, Howard will. Howard won't. Maybe Howard would have, but Irma wouldn't. Wouldn't have. Um, permitted Howard to pay my taxes. So anyhow, the next time it happened, I took my taxes down there after they passed them around and got them, finally got them to me. I took them down there and I walked in there and I laid my tax down and I said, if you want me to pay them, mail them to me. And from then on, I got the taxes. <laughs> but I mean, things like that make you look as if a woman in Eaton County, and I think it's pretty much the whole darn county, a woman is a nothing. And it isn't, um, and I think the Bible would give you that impression in a good many ways. The woman that committed um, adultery, and people wanted to throw stones at her. 
And Jesus come along and said, if you're without sin yourself, why don't throw stones at somebody else that is sinned? But what I have wondered, and I've wondered it now all my life, um, if a woman commits adultery, there's got to be somebody else involved. <laughs> well, what that somebody else involved isn't a, isn't it? Aren't they committing a sin, or is it just the woman that's committing a sin? And um, and there's been a dozen times. Uh, Theron Collins. I've often thought I'd ask him because. He would realize I wasn't just trying to be a smart aleck. And somebody else that I thought of that, uh, Todd, if Todd comes down here someday and I get to, and I'm alone with Todd, I think I will ask Todd, how do you account for the fact that um, the woman committed adultery, but there was nobody else involved? <laughs> Nowadays, we all know that if you commit adultery, it takes two people to do that. And, but anyhow, there's a Presbyterian minister that lives out here, or he's got this church on Holt Road. It isn't a church. They're still having their, holding their Presbyterian church in the schoolhouse on Holt Road. But he and another man have come here, and they've come here two different times. In the one time, I asked him, how did the woman commit adultery? And in the whole world, the woman that has the baby and isn't married, she's the guilty one. So um, I asked him, I says, there must have been two. And he said, oh, the fellow skipped out. <laughs> so that's why uh, and now Lansing has got um, 150 unwed mothers are here while back they did have. So look at those 150 sinners. And, but you see, back in Eaton Rapids at one time, they made so much of that. I mean. This girl got pregnant. She was in the 10th grade and she had to quit school. And in the Eaton Rapids paper, they would have, um, every little while, there was three girls that had to quit school because they were pregnant. One day I called Eaton Rapids General up. Why did I have to do it? Eaton Rapids has got ministers. Why didn't they see the stupid ass idea of this? Why didn't they call Eaton Rapids General up? But no, I'm the one that does it. So I call him up one day and I tell him who I am. Everybody knows who, they recognize my voice on the phone. And I told him, I said, um, my husband died. I had five children and I'm left to support them. But I said, if that first child I had had been before I was married, I would have had to quit school. But as it was, Virginia wasn't born until after I was married for better than a year. So uh, consequently, but I said, and now I wind up, uh, or yeah, I said I wind up, and this was, it, this was in the spring of 1950. It was the year I think that John graduated. I'm quite sure. So it had been 1956 that he graduated. So, uh, but again, if I had to quit school when I was in the middle of the grade, for instance, God only knows I need a high school diploma. Even if I'm not a man, I still need a high school diploma. <laughs> and um, and I said, and to me, um, I oh, well, then they put in the paper that these four girls had to quit school. That there was four that particular time. There's four girls had to quit school. And I said, um, those girls may wind up in life where they need that high school diploma and they won't have it. Um, and I said, and why do you, they never, the boys never have to quit school. And he says, well, if they're on the football team, they, they take them off the football team. So if uh, you're one of the eight or ten boys on the football team, well, you can go out and so you know, Well, you'll, you can still graduate. You still can go to school, but you can't be on the football team. And he says, well, that's the way Eaton Rapids likes it. And I says, that's not saying very much for Eaton Rapids. And, um, well, anyhow, it wasn't too long after that, and the state of Michigan passed a law that you can't make a girl quit school because she's pregnant unless you can, unless you have, have some other means of her getting her education. If Eaton Rapids wants to make a girl quit school because she's pregnant, they've got they could have her come in at eight o'clock in the morning and get her history class, or they could have her come in at four thirty in the afternoon for her English class or whatever. Then they could make her quit school, but otherwise they can't. And, um, um, but that's a law in the state of Michigan. <laughs> but 
So, um, and then it wasn't too long after that, and Eaton Everett's paper went out of business. <laughs> and so, when they couldn't spread their SHIT around, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> when they couldn't spread this gossip around, but you see, when it came out in the paper, four girls, of course, I didn't live in Eaton Rapids. If I had have lived in Eaton Rapids, I would have went to the woman next door, or the woman that graduated my class. Well, who are these four girls? But to me, I probably wouldn't know anyhow, and it wouldn't make a difference if I did know it was Susie Jones or Brown or Smith or whoever. I mean, it wouldn't mean a thing to me, because I wouldn't know these girls anyhow. Or I wouldn't know who their mothers was. That would be the what. Um, so to me, that was a disgrace for the people of Eaton Rapids. But again, when I say Eaton Rapids doesn't... Um, treat women fairly. Maybe, again, I haven't lived over there now for six years, so what's going on over there if it's now? I'm going, I don't know. <laughs> Can't say. So, um, and then in Jackson High School, um, the girls had gym suits that come down to their knees. Then they had socks that come up to their knees. Well, in gym class, the girls would take these socks and roll them right down to the top of their gym shoes, which their gym shoes come up here in their ankle area. And, um, but one day, the principal of Jackson High School walked into the gym class, and here's probably 60 girls, and the, a lot of them with their socks rolled down to their top of their gym shoes. But the principal said, any girl that's caught with her socks rolled down to the top of her gym shoes will be expelled from school. Well, now I can go get you my yearbook every year that I was in Jackson High School, and I can show you pictures. My brother, he could have had his pants clear up to here. And, um, but again, um, why did they put up with, why did they let him get away with that? Of course, nobody complained, probably. Um, but again, it goes to show his old-fashioned um, lack of brains <laughs> attitude. He'd been a, but, um, well then another thing that he did in school too, um, and of course this is this brand new high school, there's room for 2,000 people to sit there in that auditorium. So when they have an assembly, here's 2,000 students sitting there in that auditorium, or almost, because the gym, or the auditorium wasn't quite full. There was a few empty rows in the balcony, I think. And then he would point, you, and he'd keep pointing, you. You talked. Leave. Well, he points over here in your direction. I hadn't talked. But yet, it, somebody in this area had, evidently. And what I realize now, that man could not see that far. That was just a bullshit idea of his. It was his way of... Um, trying to get a message across that he's God Almighty. And, uh, well, eventually then, somebody will stand up and walk out of the auditorium. One day, I was sitting there. Well, you see, here's maybe three rows or four rows of students here. And a teacher sits back here, and so she marks who's absent. If I hadn't been there in my seat one day, she would have um, marked I was absent that day from assembly, which I'm not supposed to be. But one day, he pointed and my direction. But there was nobody sitting on either side of me. There was nobody sitting directly in front of me. And to begin with, I would, at that time, I would have been embarrassed to death to have been sent out of the auditorium. So believe me, I didn't talk. However, I realize now that I could have sat there and I could have stopped all the kids in my room there. You know, and, uh, that man up there, and I stayed that far away, he wouldn't have, uh, he wouldn't have been able to, he wouldn't have heard me, and he couldn't have seen me. Well, anyhow, so he pointed in my direction. Well, I knew it wasn't me. You can't send me out because there's nobody sitting here. And, um, but eventually, a boy stood up directly in front of me. And he, he was the one that was talking. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe he was. But he says, no, not you, the girl behind you. So I got up and walked out. Oh, I was... Um, I was embarrassed to death. Well, anyhow, uh, then I went down to the office and sat on a bench. And when the assembly was over with and he comes back and goes to his office, I just stood up and I said, Mr. Bliss, I was not talking. And he just went on his office. 
I was never so furious and had so little respect for a person as I did for him. Um, but what I did, I went to my locker and got my coat or hat or whatever I had and went home. Well, then that night I went to this Adams house to, um, for my regular job at quarter, at four o'clock or whatever. And I told her what had happened. She had, her husband was, um, there was this Adams Lumber Company and her husband, I don't know if he was president or secretary or treasurer, but he had, was an officer in the Adams Lumber Company. She had taught school in Detroit. The family was Catholic, which make, makes no difference as far as my story is concerned. And um, after, um, but I told her what happened. I said, I was not talking. I said, there was nobody sitting on either side of me. But she did play bridge with um, a man by the name of Frost, a Mr. and Mrs. Frost. And he was on the Board of Education of Jackson High School. She says, I'm going for a ride. She got in the car and I took care of the kids and watched the kids, of course. And she, I don't know where she went, what she did. I don't know. Maybe she didn't go and see Frost. I don't know. I've always surmised that she did. And um, um, when she come home, she told me, she says, tomorrow when you go to school, she says, get in your regular line that I would be if I had a legitimate excuse from my parents why I was, that I was sick yesterday or whatever, you know. Get in that line and tell whoever's in that line exactly what happened yesterday. I thought, Maybe over this, I'm going to get expelled from school. And no way did I want to get expelled from school. I mean, I want to go to school. I like school. And uh, so the next morning, I got in line. And I got there, and it was the assistant principal. It was um, in the line where the cities were supposed to go. And he said to me in real kind eyes, what happened yesterday? And I told him exactly what happened. He gave me a good excuse. <laughs> I get a good excuse for going home from school and defying the principal of Jackson High School. <laughs> but I was the last person that was ever sent out of that auditorium. Nobody else was ever sent out of that auditorium. And it was the last year he was principal there, too. <laughs> so um, uh, when I um, called up the Eaton Rapids Journal, I got a message across. And I'm glad I did. When I walked out of Jackson High School Auditorium, now I'm glad I did. At least I was the last person that was ever sent out of Jackson High School Auditorium. And, but it was the last year he was principal there, too. And, um, well, then all day long, every class I went to, and even in study hall, you see, you had to have a slip to show why you wasn't sitting in your seat uh, yesterday, whether it was in the auditorium or the um, study hall or your gym class or what. And there wasn't a teacher in study hall or any place all day long the next day that didn't say what happened yesterday. They all knew what happened yesterday. They'd all heard, but uh, maybe they thought it would get it out of my system if I repeated it. And um, so, um, but again, I've been real glad, as it turned out, I was real glad that it wound up that way. Yeah. I put a stop to something that needed a stop put to it. And that old man, he was just pushing his way day after day and day after day. And those teachers, you see, now a lot of those teachers was older people. They knew that he was, uh, he couldn't see down here. You! 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 Till somebody stood up and went out. Now those teachers knew that he was just, um, had no reason for doing that. He couldn't see. Of course, if somebody just sat there with their mouth running, he might have been able to see that. I doubt if he could have seen that. I doubt if I could in the, on an auditorium of that big. Um, I doubt if I could right today. If somebody had been just sitting there just talking away. But um, if they was talking, you can figure that they probably had their head down and they thought it wasn't talking all that loud and they could have got away with it. Um, yeah, I've often thought since then, if I'd have just stood up and said, Mr. Bliss, I was not talking. Who was I talking to? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised right then if he'd been so mad he'd have wound up and he'd had a stroke or something like that himself. 
But um, no, I think probably I handled that in about the best way possible. If uh, I hadn't have gone home, and if I'd went to my next class, but he didn't. But he was. That was just his asinine way of treating her. That was his way of. But it makes me feel today as if a lot of things that happened today, these men beating this um, black fellow up out in California, if this man hadn't stood back there with a the camera and got all of that, it never would have happened. You know, the fellow could have said, yes, I laid down on the ground and they beat me and beat me and beat me. And, um, no, it's his imagination. But the man stands back there with a the camera. But even after they've showed it on TV, I mean, we've all seen that man beat. And, but I've had women try to tell me that um, it would make a difference how you stood with your camera. No, if I beat somebody like this, I don't care where you stand with your camera. You can see that I'm beating somebody. But uh, um, here a long time ago, um, Oh, I say a long time ago, I've forgotten how long ago it was. Um, I think it was in the Reader's Digest. It told some man that uh, had a donkey, and he picked up a rail, and he hits the donkey. Then he throws the rail down, and he says, giddy up, and the, and the donkey walks off. And somebody said, why did you hit him? He says, I, ha I wanted to get his attention. And that is what happened out there. They've got his attention. They got This man taking the pictures got his attention. When I walked out of high school or a tram, I got the school's attention. When I called up the Eaton Athens Journal, I got their attention. And um, there's some people, you have to get their attention. It might mean that you hit them on the rail. <laughs> but um, no, now what, do you, what am I supposed to talk about? <laughs> well, you want to take a break for a little while? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Turn it off here. When I was in Moscow, we went to the monastery out of Moscow a little ways. They took us on a tour bus, and we crossed that Trans-Siberian Railroad. We crossed the track. <laughs> so I've never been on the Trans-Siberian Railroad that goes from Moscow to China, but I crossed the track <laughs> in a bus. So. Um, this is the second time? Or? The second time, yeah. The first time we didn't go to a monastery at all. Well, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> want to talk about um, those music programs you saw? The what? The um, John Philip Sousa. Oh, yeah. Spike Jones. Yeah. <laughs> Spike Jones was first. That was... Um, no, no. John Philip Sousa was first. Because your dad and I went there. Or, you not know, your dad, but uh, your kid's dad. Um, that, that was in Jackson? Mm-hmm. I wasn't still going to school. So it's before you were married then? John Folk Susan never uttered one word. So you can't say that he's got a deep voice or never heard his voice. But John Philip Sousa's band, if you could get the whole band in this room here, they could have played and you would have sat back here in the corner and they would have played so soft and nice that you would have loved it. But on the other hand, if you put them out here in the middle of a 10 acre field, they could have played out there and you'd have loved it too. But I mean, his band players were talented, definitely. 
they know when to blast off loud and when to play soft. So when would this would have been about what, 1930? Um, I kind of think it was the spring of 1931. I kind of think it was in the spring of the year that we got married, but um, but it was his last tour, wherever his last tour was, whether it's 19. Um, he died shortly after we got married, I think, because we was taking the State Journal in. Um, who was the man that wrote? Will Rogers wrote a little piece in the State Journal every day. And, um, but when he, when John Philip Sousa died, he never mentioned John Philip Sousa's name. However, he said, we've lost our little March King. And then he said some nice things about John Philip Sousa, but he never used his name. Hmm. But it wasn't necessary to use his name. Everybody, anybody didn't know who John Philip Sousa was, wouldn't have known who it was um, if his name had been there. Um, and of course, I, I'm positive I've still got my program. I'm positive I have, because I mean, no way would I ever throw a lot of it. Um, um, but anyhow, so we had the program, so I mean, we knew what they was going to play next, because you had done your program. Well, then they would clap and clap and clap and clap. And then they would come out, and have a name of another piece on it, on a pole, and show it, and this is extra. And then we'd go back to our programs again. And then they would be clapping, 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 and um, they would play another extra. So they played a lot of extras. But, um, um, Encores? Mm-hmm. But John Philip Sousa was, um, he was one in a good many. Where was this at? Jackson High School Auditorium. Oh, I see. That brand new auditorium. Yeah, reading the life of uh, Stalin's daughter is quite interesting. Um, but she was baptized in the Russian Orthodox, or she doesn't say Russian Orthodox Church, she says she's baptized in the Orthodox Church in, that, in 1962. I think her dad died in 1953. But, oh, he would turn over in his grave if he thought his daughter had ever been, because that's one thing that the communists decided to do away with, was religion. And Khrushchev, when he was in power, he wanted to tear down that St. Basil's Church in Red Square, but somebody wouldn't let him. Thank God for that. Oh, that would have been a crime of all crimes. Uh, when I was in, went to, in Russia the first time, um, I thought to myself, I'm not going to go in Lenin's tomb. I mean, to me, that wasn't that important. But then one day, um, I was in Red Square, and there's a lot of people lined up to go in there. So I thought, why not? So I got in line to go in. And, um, um, there was a door. You know, the door was in the middle of the building. But you come in, and his body laid like this. So you come in, and you walked up two or three, four little steps, and then you walked around the foot of his casket, or whatever you want to call it. And then I knew we were going to have to go down two or three, four little steps over here. And they wasn't lit. So I knew the thing to do was to shovel along pretty carefully and not fall down those steps. <laughs> But uh, there was a man standing there, but he took me by both elbows and got me down the steps okay, and then you went on outdoors. But as far as the him, as far as the Lennon laying there, um, it looked like he could have just been, his body could have been put there yesterday. Hmm. So, and yet it had been there, um, 1926, I think he died, 26, 36, 46, 56, 66. Um, been there pretty close to 50 years. So they must have him really... I don't know what they do to preserve a body that long. <laughs> Pickle or whatever. Um, 
Put them in pickle juice. But again, um, what they said was, you can't talk in Lane's tongue. And I, I followed it on the shop. I mean, he made a lot of laughs about that. However, the fellow shouldn't have laughed so loud. I didn't say anything, but um, I went in um, Lincoln's tomb in Illinois, and there was a big sign up when you went in, please no talking. And everybody, and of course, again, you don't see Lincoln, but you walk in and around where his body is. Um, and nobody, but you're not supposed to talk there either. Well, then you go down to Washington's, um, where Washington is entombed down there at Mount Vernon. And uh, I don't know if there's any signs up there that says no talking. However, if people do very much talking, the guards, no talking, please. So again, it isn't, but again, you see people laugh because you can't talk around lines to them. But yet, they respect it. it's okay not to talk around Lincoln's or Washington's. So, um, but you see, a lot of people don't stop to think. How would you like this if it was um, your president or your whatever? Mm -hmm. um, but on this trip to Russia, I missed so much of the things I should have been able to see. However, they went a lot of the places they went are places that I've been into anyhow, but I would love to have gone again. St. Isaac's Church, for one thing, I'd like to have gone into that, mm -hmm. but I've been there once. I've been into the Hermitage, which was really the winter palace of Peter the Great. Then we went, they took us by um, boat out to the summer palace of Peter the Great, but we come back by bus. I remember that. Oh yeah, and then one time, when I was there the first time, I rode on one of these boats that um, they kind of float on the water, but then when they start them up, it raises the boat right up. Hydrofoil? Hydro, hydrofoil. I've heard of those. So, um, but now we don't ever seem to have any hydrofoil full boats, do we? I mean, I never hear anything about it. Maybe, maybe we do. But uh, that's well, what... I think one of those boats that goes to Mackinac Island is... Oh, is it? Something like that. Hmm. I couldn't really say for sure. But, um, why don't you tell me, uh, something about Occam? We haven't really talked about Occam and Katie, like when, well, about the time they got married, how did they meet? And They met at the YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association in Jackson. Um, something went on there. I don't know what it was, but that's where Katie and many of them was at the YW. And they used to have a cafeteria there, but, um, and of course, Ockham working for consumers, working at Consumers Power, might have uh, gone there to um, eat. Um, but it kind of seems to me as if it was a meeting of some sort. But Ockham, of course, he lived in the neighborhood of, I never can think, is it Krakow or Kharkow? Krakow is in Poland, or is it in Ukraine, and Kharkow is in the other place. But he lived in the community, he lived in the Ukraine, part of Russia, but it was either close to Kharkow or Krakow. <laughs> the other one's in Poland, whichever one. Well, then he decided to go to uh, college in Czechoslovakia. And what he found out at that time was that um, while he was in Czechoslovakia going to college, what he found out was that a lot of people that went to um, uh, out of the Russia to go to school, when they got back into Russia then, they was one of these people that was killed in this unusual automobile accident. And so I think that the family got word to him, don't come back. The, uh, but you see, the thing is, I think, a lot of these people that got outside of the country they realized what was going on outside the country. You're going to buy all the bread you want. In Moscow, you couldn't. So we don't want people back in Russia here telling us what you can do and you can't do, or what other countries have got, how smart other countries are. And so they did away with people. But you see, again, 
Um, Stalin was a gnome. You know, and how sad. Now he went away to school, and supposedly he'd learned a lot, and what he could, might do to help Russia, if he could, if he'd gone back. Well, then at that time, Ockham at, at one time was quite down on the Jews, because the Jews could get into the United States easy, but him from Czechoslovakia, he couldn't. So what he finally did, but of course again at that time he didn't have money either. But what he did then, he went to Ecuador and he worked down there with a mining company for a spell. Then he got permission to come to the University of Michigan and not the University of Michigan, yeah, University of Michigan, and as a student. So he got into the United States as a student. Well then after he he took his uh, electrical engineering schooling at, the, at um, Ann Arbor and then he had to go to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, to get his uh, final degree. He got your degree from MIT, but, you got your, but he got his schooling at Ann Arbor. And um, then he came back to Jackson and worked for, um, he worked for Commonwealth and Southern, but he was stationed at Consumers Power. And probably then is when Katie got acquainted with him. That's my, my guess. And, uh, but eventually then he went back to the University of Michigan and got a degree in nuclear physics. Um, then he gets a job working for the United States government, but he's stationed down there to um, real close to uh, where, to Woodbridge, Virginia, where he finally, found, finally lived. Um, but Katie died when they still lived in Jackson. I mean, she didn't even, never live to get to go to Woodbridge, Virginia. Yeah, I've always felt, uh, when I first, first found out she had cancer, I'd go to work and I'd think, and of course again, my job wasn't a job where you had to keep your, you had to keep your brain on your job in order to get to do the certain things you're supposed to do, but it, however it wasn't, you could still be thinking about something else all day, <laughs> or what you're going to have for supper tonight, or what you should buy in the line of groceries, or whatever, but I used to think day after day and day after day, what did Ruth and I eat or do, we didn't have cancer. What did Katie do or not do that caused her to have cancer? I mean, I thought about this day after day and day after day. Uh, at one time, I know they said, um, they kind of thought that paper milk bottles, and at that time, Katie was getting her milk in paper milk bottles. We was getting ours in glass milk bottles over eating rapids. Um, and it might possibly have been the paper milk bottles because you see then in the meantime they changed the content of the paper milk bottles and of course again maybe they had nothing to do with it well then here a while back they had a class out here to michigan state it wasn't michigan state it was put on by the ingham county in ingham county something but anyhow it was in the, out here um in east lansing that they had the class on um, cancer nutrition and so I went to that class, and one thing that they said was that um, squash was a good thing. I mean, if you was apt to have cancer, eat all the squash you can. It won't cure you. If you've got it, it won't cure you, but again, it can help you. It might slow the progress of the cancer. And um, um, when Katie was a little kid, my dad raised two acres of uh, squash and sold them for seed. So here you've got two acres of these great big Hubbard squash. You can eat all you want of the squash, but save the seeds. And then again, this these have to be harvested in the fall. And of course, us kids in country school then. Um, and so just what he did, I don't know, but um, I don't think he cut each squash in two and scooped the seeds out, but he had to take them someplace and get them washed. Maybe he did scoop them all out. But anyhow, of course, we could eat squash morning, noon, and night. But Katie didn't like squash. But you see, again, if we'd known, if I didn't, if my folks had known what I know now, I would have put a, mixed a little egg in with a squash and a little cinnamon, and I would have said, this is pumpkin pie or pumpkin pudding. And, um, 
the little sugar that you'd put in it to take away, you know, she wouldn't have known that she's eat, she thought she's eating pumpkin pie all the time or pumpkin pudding or pumpkin, you can think of some fancy name for it. And, uh, but Katie didn't like squash. And so we'd keep saying to her, um, Katie, do you want some squash? And, but you know, a little kid can shake their head. And what she shook her head and what she was saying was, no, I don't want any cush, any squash. But, but she could shake her head and put, don't want any cush all in one soap. <laughs> and it was so cute the way she did it. So we always asked her about three times every meal, do you want any squash, Katie? <laughs> I want cush. Um, but I, but the rest of us, see, we all like squash, we ate a lot of squash, and that might be the thing that saved Ruth and I. I mean, I don't know. And of course, um, at this point in time, nobody else knows either. And maybe there'll be a time in history that um, we could look back and say, yes, it was a fact that she didn't eat the squash. But now they feel that if um, you should eat this yellow vegetable, but I kind of think now they might feel as if uh, carrots was just as good for you, or possibly even pumpkin is as good for you, although you don't hear much about pumpkin. But um, um, the big Hubbard squash, you do hear about that. But if, um, if I had, or you know, if I, was, if, it was, if I was the one that was managing the family dinner table, I would have... Um, done something. You could put a little lemon extract into this, or vanilla or something, into this stewed, stirred up pumpkin. <laughs> and call it, give it a different name. Uh, you know, I remember something, um, something I fed my kids once. And, uh, oh, I know, once upon a time I would take, um, uh, I, I would buy these little tiny round green squash, and the kids wasn't eating as much of that is what I figured they should. So I took the little, I'd take a little squash and cut it in two and cut the seeds all out. And then I would take a little ball of hamburg and stick in that. And then stick a carrot in for a neck or something. But this is bird's nest. And my kids love bird's nest. They ate bird's nest. Every time you want to fix it, they ate bird's nest. But again, you can do the same thing with anything that, you, that a kid doesn't want to eat. And of course, uh, with the squash, anybody could have um, um, added a little vanilla to it or something to give it a different taste. Um, and think of some fictitious name, fairy pudding or something. You know, I'm sure Katie could have eaten a lot of fairy pudding. Or <laughs> and probably us bigger kids maybe would eat more squash yet if it had been fairy pudding or something. Um, but anybody can do a lot of things to fool a little kid. Um, but again, don't ever catch them. Don't ever let them know that you're lying to them, because that's not right. If they don't, try, if you don't, if you cheat, to, cheat them on uh, squash, well, you might cheat them on Lord knows what. But for their own good, sometimes a little lie just isn't a bad idea. Where did they live? In uh, <coughs> they lived in Eaton Rapids. Too, no, no, no. They always lived in Jackson. Um, they lived in a white house, and after they'd sold, a, after they'd moved away from Jackson, after Ockham and Stephen had moved down to Virginia, the people that bought the house painted it dark red, um, and trimmed it in white, and it looked real sharp. But when Stephen came up here and saw that house, he said, oh, those people that bought that house, they just ruined it because <laughs> they painted it this dark red. <laughs> and uh, so, I, of course, I never said anything. That's okay. They ruined the house. But the house looked real sharp, huh. the people who bought it. The woman that lived next door to them, I, moved, I went there once and there was nobody home. And, uh, but, and I said to the neighbor, and I said, well, how's Katie? And of course, everybody knew she had cancer. And the woman next door, she, oh, she was so disgusted at Ockham. Because she keeps asking him, well, how's Katie? And he keeps saying, oh, about the same, about the same. But the woman, what should Ockham have said? Well, she's not as good. It looks like she might live the month out, or she might live the week out, or the um, six months out. He couldn't say that. But that's what the woman wanted him to say. 
and she thought it, he just wasn't being nice or he would have told her that. Um, well, she didn't say it exactly like that to me, but again, that's just what, all he could say is about the same. When she was downhill, downhill, downhill. But the woman could see if she had any brains, she wouldn't have had to ask him how, I mean, I can see how she might say, well, how's Katie? And uh, but no matter what Ahmed said, ignore what he said. You know, you know yourself that it'd be polite to say, how is she? But no matter what he said, she knew if she had an ounce of brains in her head, that Katie wasn't getting along as good as she I remember I went there once, and Katie was sitting on the edge of her bed. She had her legs crossed over like this, and she had her nightdress pulled down. But her legs were so thin that her feet could sit, could be right tight together, you know. And um, um, it looked to me as if she had, she had her shoes on her own foot or bedroom slippers or whatever. But the thing of it was her legs were so slim she could just set her feet right side by side. Um, yeah, um, the person that dies, if they're going to die, and dies suddenly, is um, a lot better off than the person that lives and lives. And then just dies, as you might say, by degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. However, it's a shock to the family when they, um, you get used to the fact this, and it takes a long time to get yourself convinced that the person's not going to live. And I don't know if I was ever really convinced that Katie wasn't going to live. But um, and when Phyllis Squires over Eaton Rapids, when she got cancer, I mean, I began to see a lot of things. But with her life, it was like Katie's. But again, um, you see, if I had to live back in. Um, Massachusetts, I can't tell you now, where they was burning women at the stakes, witches. Uh, and if I had said, well, Phyllis looks to me like she, she's in the same position that Katie was, I could have been burned at the stake. Because <laughs> after all, um, the fact that Phyllis didn't live, it was my fault. <laughs> um, so um, a lot of women was burned at the stake. And I remember once in being genealogy club and something was said about some woman back in history, and one man spoke up and says, be careful what you say about her because she was my great-grandmother, or great-great-great-grandmother. Of course, again, it was 100 years before his time, so he, he wasn't mourning her or anything. Um, um, but yet, um, um, he just wanted to let the world know that, yeah, he was descended from that woman. You know, something I was just <clears throat> thinking of is uh, we haven't really talked about uh, um, World War Two when that broke out. Uh, we was eating dinner one Sunday, and of course Francis was alive at that time. Um, 1941, I guess it was. But we was eating Sunday dinner, and Francis' mother and father was there. And all of a sudden, this man next door, a perfect gentleman, he opens our back door and come busting into our house. Why? Well, what he said that they just announced over the radio that, uh, or over, yeah, it's been a radio, they just announced over the radio that um, the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. And that's, a, that's how I was aware of the fact that we're in the Second World War. Um, it seems to me at that time, of course, every day you had your radio on all the time. But it seemed to me as if I had to see my dad and talk to him about that. It seemed like my dad would have, I mean, after all, he was an older man. He was, he died in 1943 when he was 70, so this is 1941. So he would have been 68. But I remember what he said was, there's wars, and there probably always will be wars. And I felt then as if, well, this is a spell we're going to have to go through, but it's the way it is. Well, anyhow, um, then eventually they had um, block wardens in Eaton Rapids. And um, so somebody in the deliverance every block had to walk around on a certain night, had to, at a certain time, had to walk around that block and see if they could see a light. And everybody was supposed to have... Um, if you had the lights on a certain room, you had to have the windows covered so that nobody would know that the light was on. 
in Francis, that was his job. He was a block warden, so he had to walk around the block. And then at a later date, they said, no, that they knew that wasn't necessary to do that, but they just wanted to make people more war conscious, which irritates me. <laughs> just think, you know, that he had to get out and walk around the block a certain night of the week when um, he might better have been staying home with his family and resting. But um, that's what it was. And then, of course, they come along with sugar rationing, and you could have so much um, sugar to can with if you can't, you know, you'd have to go down and convince them that you're going to can a bushel of peaches or four bushel of peaches or whatever it was. And uh, I always canned more than anybody else did, but everybody had more sugar than I did. So how you figured that out, I don't know. Evidently, they told lies or something because I told the truth, and uh, they all got more sugar than I did. <laughs> but uh, again, I don't care. Again, we didn't need the sugar anyhow. I mean, we didn't need that. You needed the sugar would help the peaches to to keep. Them. I mean, you could it'd be easier to for them not to spoil if they had little sugar in them. But I never had anything spoiled, or almost never. I have had things spoiled. But one woman across the street from us once canned a bushel of peaches, and the whole bushel spoiled. But what she said, she was pregnant at that time, and everybody knew that when pregnant women canned peaches, they didn't keep. So again, but again, I'd taken can cooking in Jackson High School, and um, what I realized, you've got to get them to a certain point of. Uh, a certain temperature before you put them in the can. You've got to sterilize your cans. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And if you do it, what you're supposed to do, they won't spoil. But once in a while, I'd have a can of something spoiled, but it's so few and far between. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and then shoes was racing during the war. We'd always been buying the kids um, maybe two ninety-five shoes, or maybe yeah, probably about two ninety-five. Well, then you could only have. Um, maybe two pairs of shoes a year. Well, if we'd been buying three pairs of shoes a year at uh, 2 dollars we've got to get them some better shoes then, um, if they can only have two pairs this year. So we started buying them better shoes, and I realized then we'd been foolish, or everybody was foolish to buy these cheaper shoes. These better shoes lasted. It was cheaper in the long run to buy the more expensive shoes. So. Um, and then, of course, when the kids got went to school, the bottom uh, snowsuits. And, um, but I remember making Virginia and Clara both snowsuits, and also the Francis' um, sister's two girls, I made those two girls snowsuits out of a woman's coat that was, um, you know, a woman could wear a coat and it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be worn out. Well, what I mean, it might be awful ragged around the cuffs or something like that. And of course, if the woman had the money, she bought a new coat. So you take that old coat and rip it apart and wash it and make a new snowsuit of it and that would get a kid through for a, a year easy. So I've done that and made the kids quite a few. Yeah, I wish sometimes that I had, uh, I, at one time I had a box of scrap cloth. I had it since I lived here. And I finally sent it to the Salvation Army because they'll send it to some old people's home or something where all those scraps will be made up into something, a quilt or something. And Lord only knows I had a lot of scraps. But I wish now I had them because I could, I bet there wouldn't be a piece of cloth in that whole, a scrap in that whole box that I couldn't have said, you know, this is Virginia's dress, this is Clara's dress, this is a trans shirt. And I wish I had it now. Yeah. But um, I haven't, which is a good thing. Might as well forget it, I guess. So, um, well, when the kids were getting older, well, I, I remember that. Uh, there was a car that both Paul and Robert owned together? Um, no, the car was Robert's, I think. He had that Dodge, a 1929 Dodge, and he had a license on it, where you only have to buy one license a lifetime. Um, but of course you couldn't drive it every day to work, or you was only supposed to use it for special occasions, I guess, I don't remember. But anyhow, um, somebody come along and said that he was driving it more than what he should have. And he was not. I mean, right then, right then's when I should have st stood up and um, really spoke my piece. Some fellow over at Charlotte was driving his way beyond. Look, Robert was not. 
and uh, but again, it took me quite a spell to get to the point where I'd stand up for myself or stand up for what I believed. But eventually, I got to the point that I didn't mind telling anybody what happened. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but you see, men could stand up. Now, if his dad had been alive, he could have said he did not. And they, that was acceptable. But women that do that are bitches. And no woman wants to be a bitch. But finally I made up my mind, I don't give a damn if I am a bitch. I'm going to still uh, do the things that I think. Um, and when you get to that point, you're, you've progressed. So what happened then? Uh, well, eventually he sold the car. But he didn't sell the car, though, until after he went to service. But he got a chance to sell it. Must have been quite a while because I remember the car. Oh, you do remember it? Or else maybe he had a second one after that. No. Um, he went into service in 1956, the year he was born. Uh, and how long he had the car after that, I, I don't know. But he was living out in Colorado, and he said um, if, um, oh, well, somebody had told John that they would, um, give him so much money for that car. $200, that seems to me, is what it was. And John had went down and sent a telegram to Robert that he had a chance to sell it for $200. But for some reason or other, they just had put two. And uh, I guess they hadn't really mentioned the real price. So what they wanted, so they, the telegraph company phoned me when I was at home and wanted to know, was that supposed to be $200 or $2,000 that that car was being sold for. Of course, they didn't know what year it was or anything. But if it was a new Dodge, it would, or well, comparably new, it could have been sold for $2,000. But they wanted the telegram to be right. So, and I said, it, it wasn't $2,000, it must have been $200. <laughs> and, uh, but anyhow, Robert um, sent a message back to sell it. So, that's what, and who bought it, I don't have any idea. I don't remember me sending the money to Robert. I don't remember. Maybe the... And maybe I did. I mean, maybe the man... I just don't remember. Wasn't John in a pretty bad car accident about that time? Uh, John was in... Um, uh, John was with another boy, and they, and I think it was John's car that got smashed up, wasn't it? I mean, you'll have to ask John about that. Um, I just can't think now how, um, but I know I stayed home from school, or stayed home from work that day. I found out about it early in the morning. Oh, I guess uh, John, I got up in the morning and John was supposed to come home, come home at night and he didn't. I got up in the morning and my gosh, he still wasn't home. So then I called um, the woman um, whose son had gone with John the night before and she said, and she told me that they'd been in an accident and John was in the hospital of Dean Rapids. So then I called the hospital. I think they was afraid I was going to come up to the hospital and beat John. <laughs> I mean, that's it. But again, um, when you're already in the hospital, I guess you've learned your lesson, haven't you? <laughs> that you should... Um, but his car was really smashed up. And I think I've got a picture of his smashed up car. I'm quite sure I have. Um, I think John took a picture of it and ha took four or five pictures. Um, so I know John's got a picture of the smashed up car. But yet, why didn't they call me early in the morning and let me know that it happened? Um, yeah, there's a good many times that um, <laughs> the mother's the last to know. And I was the last to know in that case. Everybody else knew before, before I did. And it was the hospital that didn't want to call you, or John didn't want you to know? Well, John was in the hospital. So, um, and John was only maybe 16 years old. So the hospital should have realized that, hey, you know, I'm the one that's going to have to settle the bill. Um, so even no matter what John had said, they still should have called me and told me. But maybe they thought, well, wait and see how bad he is first. I, I don't know what they're... 
thinking was. Um, but just before they were supposed to, I had my lunch up. I was, I was already going to work. Um, and then when they stopped to pick me up, take me to work, whoever was supposed to take me, I just come to the door and said, no, I'm not going in today. So, um, you know, there's quite a few times that I had some, uh, what you might call fingernail or nail biting experiences. Remember any others? Uh, about one every day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I forgot a lot of them, for certain. Um, yeah, one day, um, the twins, let me think, now how did that go? The twins were sleeping in, uh, oh, they wanted to sleep in their uh, little tent. They bought a little army tent. Um, you, but you bought it in two pieces. I think it's $3 a piece. Well, then you can take two of them and fasten them together at the peak. And then each of them had a piece so they could make a little, um, like a little two-man tent. And they had it out in the backyard. Well, then they decided to let the dog sleep in the tent with them. Well, of course, in the early in the morning, or sometime during the night, the dog gets out. And it was the time of the year when you're not supposed to have your dog loose. So I was laying there in bed, and the dog come up to the back door and barked. So I got out of bed, put my bedroom slippers on, my house coat, to go out and get the dog. And by the time I got there, the dog was gone. So I went back and got back in bed. This is maybe 4 o'clock. Well, then the next time I heard the dog bark, that time I just hopped out of bed and grabbed my house coat and went barefooted. But as I went down off the porch um, to, to grab the dog, uh, I turned my ankle over and fell down. So then I, I think I got the dog that time and tied him up or brought him in the house or something. And then I got in the bathroom and I felt like, or what my feeling was, I'll stick my foot in the, under the faucet in the bathtub and rinse my feet off before I get back into bed. And, um, but by the time I got in there, I realized I might faint. <laughs> and uh, so then I went in the front room and Carl wasn't home. Virginia was sleeping in the front bedroom alone. So then I went in there and I wake Virginia up and I say, I think I'm going to faint. So I go out and sit down in the chair in the living room and pass out. Well, then she gets up and she comes out there and she sees I passed out. So she goes out in the next room and she passes out, but she wets on the floor when she passes out. <laughs> and um, so I come to and nobody there. Evidently Virginia didn't even wake up. Well, then I must have passed out again. You know, when you pass out, you, you're there and then you're not there. The next time I come to, she was sitting in the living room chair there. And she said, um, should I call the folks upstairs? And I said, yeah. So I don't know if she dialed them or, yeah, she probably dialed them on the phone and told them. So they both come downstairs. Um, well, then what they said, well, we better call the doctor that lives up the street there from us. He lived in the apartment up there, and I, Dr. Sherman, I think it was. So they called him, and he come. But um, when the folks at the tears come down, they said um, somebody said, "Well, has the six five whistle blown yet?" And of everybody there, I was the only one that said yes. I mean, I knew it had. Of course, the doctor probably knew it too. But maybe he would ask me just to see how long, what I knew, you know. And then they, the doctor said, well, what, um, this accident across the street, when did that happen? Um, I kind of have think, I don't remember now for sure if I'd heard that car smash up over across the street. I don't remember now. And I never did see it because they got taken away by the time I got up on the down for it. But anyhow, um, the way they left it is I supposed to go down to the hospital and have um, my ankle x-rayed at um, 9 o'clock or something, I forget what. But in the meantime, I had to go to the bathroom and I realized my ankle was all right. You know, it was pain, painful, but it wasn't broken or anything like that. I could get to the bathroom. So we called up and said, forget the x-ray, I'm not going to have that. And um, so I laid there on the davenport all day then. The doctor said, I remember if he said, put ice on my ankle or something, somebody did. And um, 
uh, eventually um, the mailman come. <laughs> that was a great name. Oh yeah, this is when I started in a Marie shop. I should have been done. So somebody had called Marie shop up and tell them I couldn't come to work. And uh, um, then um, the mailman come, and of course he could look and see me laying right there in front of the door on, on the davenport. He says, what's the matter with you? And I says, well, I fell down and hurt my ankle. So then he opened the door to come in and hand me my mail. And uh, when he did that, the screen door come off the hinges. So then he come in, set his mail sack down, went out in the kitchen and got the screwdriver and the proper tools to put the hinge back on the door. And he did. Um, um, that makes me think of something else that happened once too, I should tell. Um, well then a woman down the street come up, Blanche Jardin in. And she came in and just a good minute. I can't think. Something funny happened with her. Well, she was there, but I can't think now what it could have been. Well, then later on that day, um, um, John was out in front, and another kid threw a stone and hit him in the head and knocked John out. So some strange man picks John up, brings him up to the back door, <laughs> and I guess John comes too right quick. Um, but after all, this is kind of nerve-wracking for a person that's sick of bed. <laughs> and, um, well, the next day I went back to work. And Marie said, Marie down to Marie's shop, she said, well, do you feel like working today? I said, no, I don't, but I can't take another day at home. <laughs> that's more I can take. <laughs> yeah, I said I felt like it. So they gave me something so that I was sitting down most all day writing something or doing something. So there was an accident in front of your, right in front of your house? Yeah. <laughs> Car smashed up. John got knocked out. Uh, the mailman put the door back on the hinges. And <laughs> Meanwhile, the twins are out back in their tent, sleeping. Yeah. They don't know anything about it, right? <laughs> um, well, I don't remember how long, I don't know how long they slept. Well, then something else that happened one day that's funny, too. Um, and I didn't know this until... Uh, uh, maybe John was 21 years old, or maybe the twins were 21 years old. The kids were growing up anyhow. But something was said about um, the mailman come along there one day, and oh, John was out sprinkling in the yard. And John was just a little toad. But you see, again, the kids would let him do things that he wouldn't have done if I'd have been home. Uh, because, I mean, I would realize that he doesn't have the judgment of uh, <laughs> a lot of things. So John was out sprinkling in the front yard. The twins were upstairs on the front porch, and they're the ones that knew what happened. Uh, but again, I, nobody told me for years. Um, but John was sprinkling in the front yard. Well, then the mailman comes along. So John now, he wants to move the hose from here to here. So he swings it around and hits, hits the mailman with the hose. And the mailman, of course, he doesn't realize that John is really only three years old, maybe. And he thinks he's more like five or six, you know, because John was a big kid. So he takes his mail sack off and sets it down on the ground and paddles John's pants, because after all, John needs punishment. And while uh, he's uh, punishing John, the dog gets the mail sack and he shakes, he shakes it all over the wet grass. And, but now, you see, I didn't know about that until um, the kids were beyond punishing them. I mean, it was too late to punish anybody for <laughs> that episode. Um, so things happen. <laughs> things happen. Yeah, they sure do. Um, yeah, a lot of funny things happen. Uh, <laughs> that mail sack episode. But again, that, that mailman, he was a mailman that he... Well, once he was in the barber shop downtown, and I was in there too, waiting to get my hair cut, and he was waiting to get his hair cut. And I can't think now what was said. Um, I remember who said it. I can't think what their name was, but they lived south of town on the place that um, Clinton Smith had lived once upon a time. But what the mailman said was, every kid needs a whipping once a week whether he's done anything wrong or not, <laughs> or something to that effect. You know, give all your kids a whipping once a week whether they do anything wrong or not <laughs> and uh, so you see again when he paddled John's pants he figured that he was I wasn't home and he knew I wasn't home and John needed his pants paddled and him being the good mailman he paddled his pants <laughs>
But I think if he'd had you over again, he might better have forgiven John for having you soaked him with a hose or hit him with a hose and went on down the block peddling his mail. <laughs> he would have saved himself a lot of trouble. So, um, Lord only knows who got their mail that day and who didn't and who <laughs> could be even um, that some people, some of the mail, he couldn't even read it. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't home and I didn't know about it for 20 years, so. It was, uh, you had a dog then? That was your dog? Um, yeah, it probably was our dog. But I don't know what dog it could have been. I'm not just sure. Yeah, after the kid's dad died, I went over to, um, the dog kennel over here to Lansing. Um, and got a dog. And, um, but they told me over there that um, if for any reason we didn't keep the dog, didn't want to keep the dog, we've got to take it back there. We can't just give it to somebody else. We've got to bring it back to them. So, uh, but that dog would snap at John. And the insurance man was at our house one day and he said, I'd get rid of that dog. Sooner or later he's going to bite John. I think maybe the dog was a little jealous of um, John. I, you know, we all paid attention to John, and I think uh, if we'd ignored John and paid more attention to the dog, it would have been good. But the dog, I liked the dog, and the dog would, uh, I'd be down to Hornerst to go to work, and the dog would follow me down there, and then when I got out of work, the dog would be down there at Hornerst to escort me home. <laughs> and I mean, uh, but I think he wanted to be my dog, and he didn't want John to be my friend. <laughs> and uh, so again, I finally, had, I did, I took the dog one day and took him back to the kennel where Lansing where he got him. And um, it wasn't a kennel, it was um, a dog pond, which amounts to a dog pond, I guess. What's and the dog's I, name, you remember? The kids might tell you, but I can't remember. Huh. So I took the dog back over there, and I think their feeling was that I might better have kept the dog and got rid of John. <laughs> at least that's their opinion they gave me at that time. <laughs> well, anyhow, I didn't. I said to keep John, get rid of the dog, so we did. <laughs> well, so, John's um, glad about that. Yeah. <laughs> At least I don't think John would have been happy if we'd left him over at the dog kennel. Those people, not over there anyhow. So, um, yeah, things happen. So, well, we were talking a little bit there earlier. We started talking and we kind of got away from it about um, when the girls started having boyfriends and whatnot. And yeah, the girls had plenty of boyfriends. How did you handle that? With well, this one boy up Deaton Rapids, I didn't have to worry about that. Um, that was no problem. But he liked Virginia, and he wanted to say something nice to Virginia. So he thought of the idea of calling her fat black. <laughs> and that isn't how you win a girl's heart. <laughs> you don't call her fat black. <laughs> so uh, that's one boyfriend I never had to <laughs> watch, because he didn't, we didn't see that much of him. <laughs> Virginia didn't want to be called Fat Black. <laughs> uh, no, to him, he he didn't uh, he didn't realize that girls didn't want to be called fat. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, that was cute. Oh, I don't know. I didn't have uh, any special. I mean, there's a fat boy that liked Virginia, but I don't remember. There wasn't that friendly, or I guess there wasn't that much to think about. <laughs> so, um, yeah, kids are fun. How did uh, they eventually meet their husbands? Um, of course, Armour lived right there in Eaton Rapids and went to school in Eaton Rapids and was okay. in the same grade as Clara. But your dad, how your dad ever got acquainted with Virginia, I, I'm i just not sure. I think he met her at the, didn't she work in an ice cream stand? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's it. She worked at a place where they sold, um, not even real sure where it was. Kind of seems like it was down on the street where he built the island. And, um, yeah, so again, we saw a lot of Al. And, uh, and everybody liked him, of course. It wasn't only Virginia liked him, but the whole family liked him. Yeah, I feel bad a good many times to think that the kid's dad didn't live. So much of their lives, I mean, he never saw. Because after all, Virginia was only 13 when he died, so. 
and Carl's only 11 and the twins 8. And John was 16 months old, so so John, I mean, he never even, he doesn't remember his father at all, of course. So it's too bad. Um, and the twins, right now, they'll tell you that they don't, they hardly remember their dad. I, I think they might tell you that they don't remember their dad at all. But I think at that time, I think it was a case of forget this person that died. I mean, because it, a lot of people in Rapids, I think, thought, well, if I could just forget that Francis, I ever knew Francis, I'd be better off. You don't just forget somebody. Somebody you've lived with for 15 years and had five children by, you don't forget them. You're going to remember them as long as you live. Um, but again, you see, the world has learned a lot in the last 50 years or 40 years or whatever. And the world is still learning a lot. Yeah. You know, and of course, again, when I was a kid, I was born into a different world than what Virginia was born into. But again, um, you was born into a different world, and different circumstances, and different everything than what um, your mother was born into or your dad. Um, and with a thousand and one things, uh, I mean, and of course, once upon a time, a girl that had a baby and didn't have a husband, oh, she was a really a trollop, you know. Uh, I mean, Boy, you didn't, you crossed the street, so you didn't even have to meet her on the street. Oh. But uh, the same, but the father of that child, you didn't have to cross the street to avoid him. After all, he's got to go and get his education, because some of these days he's going to get married and have a family to support. But of course, uh, the single mother is never going to have a family to support. Of course, nowadays they do, but... <laughs> um, but you see, it was um, along about 1956 before they before they passed the law that you couldn't just tell this girl to quit school. So you see, society has sometimes it takes them a long time to make. But you see, my mother couldn't vote until I was um, I was 10 years old before my mother was smart enough to vote. But my mother could have been a school teacher and she could have taught um, the boys how to vote. <laughs> But yet, she wouldn't be smart enough herself to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, there's so many things that happened in the past that nowadays people can't believe that they happen. At one time, uh, a man could, in, or a woman could inherit maybe $5,000. But that was her husband's money after she once inherited it. And then he could have a mistress down the street and use the $5,000 to support his mistress. But that was all right, after all. She was his possession. <laughs> of course, again, uh, in the church service, the, uh, the bride's father gives his daughter in marriage. She gives his daughter. She didn't sell that daughter to that man. She gave it to him, or they gave it to her. And uh, a good many times, I think, that maybe churches should, could be a little smarter in some of the things that, some of the things that, um, uh, this Presbyterian minister that come here and he sat on the davenport here and the other man sat over there in a chair, probably that rocking chair over there. And um, I can't think now just because we weren't discussing, um, I don't know, the world in general, I don't remember what, but, but anyhow, that man, he said something about the man was always the head of the house. And he says now he and his wife, they discussed things. But in the long run, it's his decision now. Well, the thing of it is, um, some men are chefs. They probably teach their wives a lot of things. And that's okay. Let them go ahead and teach their wives um, what they've learned by being a chef. But on the other hand, maybe the woman has worked in the bank, and maybe she knows a lot of things about whatever might go on in the bank. <laughs> I never worked in a bank, so I wouldn't, there's a lot of things that might go on in a bank that I wouldn't know. But again, um, but anyhow, but what this man said, but what the man says is final. What I should have said right then, well now who should have decided what color to paint our house or when it needed a new roof, when my when God had taken my husband. 
That's what I should have asked him. You know what I mean? Some of these people, they'll put you on the defensive. The thing of it is, if you can swing it around, put them on the defensive now. Who should have decided what color our house should have been painted? Or who should have been the one that paid for getting it painted? <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> and, um, but after you've lived as long as I have, you've heard a lot of people's opinions about things. This is the way it should be, and so on and so forth. And, um, However, I thought that the man, the, the Presbyterian minister, I thought he was nice, and he said, oh, he skipped out. The man that, the woman had committed adultery, but there's nobody ever committed adultery with her. Oh, he skipped out. But, and I th but again, when I see uh, Theron Collins, I'm going to say to him, what happened to the man that the woman committed adultery? See what he says. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. See what he has to say. It's, uh, I don't think, I think you can do it in such a way, I don't think Theron would feel that I was trying to be smart aleck, you know. Um, but in the past, what they used to say, of course, is that the men were so much superior to the white woman in intelligence. And I kind of think maybe they was, because these women have fallen for this for centuries, that the woman committed adultery. And I don't think it... And maybe a lot of them in their own minds wonder, well, how could she have the adultery when there was nobody else involved? But yet, I think women a good many times, well, yeah, she's been the adultery. And that's all there is to it. And they don't question. And it seems to me as if women had um, did a little thinking, they would realize, hey, that's stupid. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. The Bible doesn't tell you that the man skipped out. But again, I sometimes think I'd like to say to some of these men too, it was the men that wrote the Bible. They wrote it for men. Because after all, at that time, um, your wife could have uh, inherited $5,000. But it was your $5,000 after she once got the money home. That was, that's your $5,000. You can buy another house or have a mistress up the street if you want to. But you see, um, the Bible was written by men for men. Um, and I think sometimes, but not like over Eaton Rapids, why didn't some of those ministers realize, hey, that's not fair to make these girls quit school? Or did they feel as if, that's not our business? But it seemed like sometimes when the, the ministerial association, when they got together, somebody could have said, well, do you think that's right that Eaton Rapids Journal does this? Um, and, but as far as I know, I never heard that it was, wasn't was right. Um, and of course, the minute you found out that there's four girls in Eaton Rapids that uh, was pregnant and had to quit school, the next thing is, who are the four girls? <laughs> but uh, again, you see, I didn't graduate from school in Eaton Rapids, and I think some of these people, I'm going to tell them, I didn't graduate from school in Eaton Rapids. How come Eaton Rapids did this? I didn't graduate from school in Eaton Rapids. How come Eaton Rapids did that over there? Or what? And um, so while they was wasting all their time telling me what my, that I had run in my sock, the seam wasn't straight, I had more rouge on this cheek than I did on this one, um, and I was keeping still, trying to abide by their rules, and I think I should have been tr putting the potato, the hot potato back in their um, lap or hand or whatever. <laughs> um, so I think right now I'd like to live long enough to teach some of these women along. Tell them what I think, and I and I'm going to. I mean, when some of these people, I'm going to say, how come we got 15, 150 girls in Lansing that don't have uh, husbands? We don't have any men in Lansing that don't have wives. We don't have any pregnant men. <laughs> so how can we have pregnant women when we don't have any 150? Um, if we've got 150 unwed mothers, we must have 150 unwed fathers someplace. Where are they? <laughs> um, when I, but a lot of these things I should have been handing back to them 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But it took me a long time to get up nerve enough to say some of the things. But again, then I wouldn't send them to only some of these women that think that I'm just wasting money talking to them, or wasting time talking to them, because they're not going to do anything about it. I might better have been asking the ministers. Um, how come this happens, or how come 
that happens. Um, they really hear what they want to hear anyway. Uh, but again, they might not hear either. They might be totally deaf. Yeah, and then when the twins' dad died, I remember a Mr. Um, Calford, for one, and he was a retired Baptist minister. But I remember he said, now you'll have to be the man in the family. That's piling too much responsibility onto an eight-year-old boy, even though there's two of them. How can they be the man in the family? They can't quit school and go to Oldsmobile to work. They can't even quit school and go out and try to spade up the ground behind the garage and plant a few vegetables. No, because the law is going to be on me for not having those kids in school. So how can... But right then, I think to some of those ministers, or to that minister, and then there was other people that said the same thing. Um, what I should have said, but again, this this is the first time I'd ever had a husband die. You know what I mean? If I had my life live over again, there's a lot of things I could have said. But um, um, I would like to say to some of these people, how can how can this eight-year-old boy be the father in the family? He can't even write a check. Even if he had a checking account, he isn't old enough to write a check. <laughs> um, but some of these things you see was said, had been said for a hundred years, so you just keep on saying them, you know. And of course at one time, if um, back in log cabin days, um, a lot of boys didn't go to school much beyond age 10. They stayed home and worked. But we had long gone past that period. The United States hadn't done that for a long, long time. You know, take a kid out of school. Um, but somebody should have, um, and I'm sorry it wasn't me. When uh, Francis died, didn't you say that the funeral was right at the house? No. No, the funeral was in the Baptist church. Downtown Eaton Rapids? Eaton Rapids Baptist Church. It's on, um, the, on the way to Shawat. Of course, Division Street and um, the road to come to Shawat, they meet right out there. Division Street runs right on the Shawat Road. And the church is right there on that corner, on that pie-shaped piece of ground. No, he had a um, church funeral. Is there a wake or something at your place? No, um, he died in the hospital, and of course his body was taken um, to the funeral home. And then the day of the, and it was in the funeral home until the day of the funeral, and then they took it to the church. And so the funeral procession went from the church, and it, again, that was one of the biggest funeral processions I'd ever had in the Rapids. But when uh, my mother's father died in 1909, I think right then, I think that, that was one of the biggest funerals that they'd ever had in uh, that locality. But his funeral, to tell the truth, I never stopped thinking about it. But oh, I, at that time, I know his funeral would have been at home. Because when they first begin to have funerals and taking the body to the funeral home, now you see, I remember that. After all, you didn't think much of your husband or you wouldn't have his body taken out of the funeral home. Um, or the wife or whoever died, you know. So uh, anyhow, a good respectable family would have had the bed and the dresser and all the furniture moved out of the bedroom, and the casket would have been in the corner of the bedroom. Um, to tell the truth, I don't think I ever went to a house funeral. Of course, again, I was the type of a kid that if I'd gone to the funeral, I probably would have shed more tears, even though I didn't even know who the person was. And so I think probably, um, Anybody else's child would probably got to more funerals than what I did. Um, and maybe not either. No, I went to Grandma Creole's funeral, but Grandma Creole's funeral was in the Methodist Church. And when my father's father died, us kids had up and go, so of course we didn't go to Colonel Curian. So uh, the, they was going to take us so that, we'd see, um, so that we would see Grandpa Collins um, in the casket, but then they never did. I don't know. Um, he died, I think, in the 10th of May. He would have been buried in a few days. He was a Mason, and so he had a Masonic funeral. 
Um, but as far as I know, his promo is over on the Collins' house. Um, but the fact he was a Mason could, could it possibly have been in the Masonic colony? I don't hardly think so. But again, I'm not sure. No, I went to Grandma Prior's funeral, which would, uh, it should have been, um, she was a Goodyear girl, it was her father and the whatnot, and her husband was Robert Howard, um, young Robert Howard, and uh, again, her husband died when uh, Aunt Katie used to always say that uh, this Adelaide Goodyear Howard, she was always kind of a sad person. You know, I've heard that all my life, or, you know, I've heard her say it 40 times. She was always kind of a sad person. Well, then you get to doing genealogy, and what you realize, she had three girls, two of them died at maybe six months or three months or two years, and only one girl lived, and that was um, my grandmother, Hattie Howard. Uh, her husband died when Hattie Howard was... Um, just a matter of two or three years old, two and a half years old. In fact, Grandma Howard, she, or Grandma Hattie Howard, told me that the only thing she remembers about her father was her dad was laying on a couch, and he was sick, and he says, come over here, Hattie. And she was sitting in a little chair, so she just took hold of her little chair, and bent over, and walked over, and chair and all, and sat down, and, that, and that's all she remembers of her father. And so um, her mother, she'd lost, she'd lost her husband, she'd lost, lost two little girls, but her husband, you see, was only 35 years old or something when he died. She had lost one brother and one sister, and they're the ones that, um, the Goodgers that had the whatnot, or the, the Grandpa Goodger that made the whatnot, they was pretty well off financially. And, uh, but they had a grand piano, and then this little teeny weeny piano that I've got in the bedroom there, that belonged to, um, that belonged to Grandma, uh, we always called Grandma Creole, which mm -hmm. was, which was a Goodyear girl. She married, or I mean, she was a Goodyear girl, and then she married this Howard, and he died, and she had the three little girls, and the two died so young, then her husband died so young. Uh, then eventually she married this Burke Creole and had one more child than that child right at age 13. The, the girl that had the little red dress. Um, What's this whatnot that you're talking about? This thing with all the little things on it. He made that. No, no. What was he to you? Um, he was my grandmother's grandfather. I'm not really getting a very good picture of it. He was your grandmother's grandfather? Yeah. Grandpa Goodyear. And the Goodyear Bible is right down there on the bottom shelf, all wrapped up in... I've always had... For years, I had it just laying there. Finally, I realized the thing to do is to wrap it in plastic. And don't let it get dirty, you know. Um... But my grandmother, she turned the wheel so that he could make the rolling pen, the rolling pen that I've got. So, I mean, so it's a one-piece rolling pen. I mean, the handles are made right onto it. I mean, they wasn't, they wasn't made onto it. They grew onto it. <laughs> it was already there. And, uh, but when you... Look up, Jeannie. Oh, yeah, then that's what I was going to say then. They had this grand piano. And, uh, but anyhow, the, there was two boys and a girl. And they could all sing and they could all play. And in that day and age, when you had a party, you furnished your own music. You didn't turn on the radio and everybody dance or turn on the TV and everybody watch whatever. <laughs> uh, well, then she loses the one sister on Christmas Day. And I, she loses one brother, and I'm not sure what she lost two brothers. Within a matter of three or four years, she lost at least one brother and one sister. 
and maybe it was two brothers and one sister. I can't say without looking it up. So again, uh, plus she lost her two babies, two little girls, and her husband. Now, do you think she had any reason for being sad? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, well, then the thing of it is, when somebody in the in the community had a party, they had no grand piano. They could go and take this little uh, um, organ that I've got, and they could take it and. Um, uh, some of them, some of that family could play, and everybody else could sing. But you see, they didn't have that much entertainment. So again, uh, if you could sing or if you could play the piano or do something, boy, you was welcome to all the parties. And they, so they went to all the parties, and was invited to all the parties. Hmm. Well, then he worked for, I um, can't think of the name of the place he worked for. Um, but anyhow, he made, uh, he made a little plow, uh, and Alan has got that, or Alan had, of course, now one of Alan's kids has got it. Um, but he also made a little steamboat, but that was so years and years and years ago. I mean, I, that's something I never saw, but and the family's always felt bad to think somebody had sold it, let it go. Um, well, then you go down here at the state capitol. Or go down here to uh, the new library, and in that there is a plow back there. And it, I'm pos I'll bet you anything that uh, my grandpa Goodyear had something to do with making that plow. In fact, uh, it might almost, the one that Alan has got, the little one that Alan's got, might possibly be the original that that big one is made, made off from. I'm not, I don't know. But I wouldn't be too surprised. Mm -hmm. Oh, then um, you've heard of the Courier Knives pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, these old pictures that are made by Courier Knives. Well, the Ives are our relation. But you see, when the Ives girl married this Goodyear boy, she was just marrying somebody that was in the, had the same interests that her family had. Um, but I've never, I don't think I've ever traced the Ives family back that far or back too far. I mean, I know that she was an Ives girl, and I don't know if I know for sure who her parents was or not. I'm, uh, I've got to get back with my genealogy and do some. Do you mind if I turn on the uh, air conditioning? Sure, turn it on. I'm just sweating it out here. <laughs> um, yeah, well, well, you can turn this on, would uh, Yeah, you can turn that on. Um, Let's turn the air a little bit. Let me get back and, yeah, you go ahead and turn the air conditioner on and shut the door. Well, why don't I just turn this on for now? Okay. Where's the switch on it anyway? Oh, I'm the dashboard. Turn it clear. You can turn it a little bit and it'll be on full strength or turn it a little further and... That's good. Yeah, I try to get along without the air conditioner when I can, but now right now you see me with no sleeves, I'm not that hot. <laughs> I don't know why I am. Boy, I'm just... I'm well, so again, if I had... Um, and it might be too that if you were sitting in a more comfortable chair, you'd be more relaxed. I suppose. That feels good. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes um, I turn that right towards the ceiling. But um, this is where the cool air is going to be, isn't it? I mean, yeah. when your kids are little, um, their grown ups all sit around nodding because they're asleep. And the so kids warm. are sitting on the floor and they're wide awake, but again, they're not breathing in the hot air that the folks are. And then again, if you're going to sleep in the top bunk, you're not going to be needing the blankets that the person does that sleeps down here in the bottom bunk. I, uh, I worked with a guy once. Move your chair over there so you're sitting right in front of it if you want to. Oh, I'm just going to turn it this way. I worked with a guy when I lived in Petoskey there, that, uh, when he was in the Army at one point, one time he was stationed or had to do something it was either in Alaska or someplace way north in Canada or something and it was during the winter time and they were living in this not not a real igloo but it was shaped mm -hmm. like an igloo mm -hmm. some sort of a metal hut or something and uh, it was so cold on the floor and down low that you had to you always had to wear boots you know, your big heavy boots and then your heavy leggings. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you're, you know, up about this far, it was warmer. So you could just sit in your 
shirt sleeves, and you'd be you'd be warm enough that way. Of course, that ground is probably froze too. Yeah. After all, you're sitting there with your feet on the block of ice. That's a different story. Yeah. That was quite interesting. But the they would have bunks in there, and uh, the guy that slept on the top bunk could just barely breathe because it was so warm. Yeah. Because the guy in the bottom bunk was all. My feeling is. Uh, I've got this book on how to make a um, tea thing, but my feeling is that if you'd been living in a long, in a 1790 log cabin, or you'd had your choice of living in a good teepee, I think you'd have been about as well off living in the teepee. Um, of course, a log cabin, you could have a real fire in it, but again, you couldn't have um, the log cabin wasn't all that good either. Uh, I mean, they might have a window that square. And if you got your glass broke out, sorry, but you can't have another glass. Because during, uh, during the Revolutionary War, about in that time, a glass was rationed. Um, but the teepee, if it gets uh, too warm in here, or if we want some fresh air, maybe it's summertime, you'd like to have your TP cool, you can open it up at, at your top up, you know, and your heat's going to go out. So your teepee's been set out there in the sun all day, but again, you could open that top up, and the heat's going to go up and out. Well, um, in the log cabin, if it gets too hot, well, you got these two windows you can open and let the mosquitoes in. <laughs> so I think probably... Um, the Indians were just as well off. Of course, eventually they made their log cabins better. Um, but I think for a long, I think for quite a spell there. And then, of course, the teepee, you could take your teepee down in the spring of the year and you could go over to Vermontville and tap some of those maple trees over there and you could make your maple syrup. And then you could take your teepee and you could go on up someplace else wherever the next crop was harvested. Um, so in some ways, I think that teepee was, and it was, the, the woman was the one that made the teepee. And the woman, it was the woman's responsibility to get it moved now from here out to uh, And I always, I always get a kick out of how different uh, countries have done different things and whose job it is to do what and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. So, um, um, yeah, it's... Uh, we haven't talked to 